All right, I think we can start. I was just ready when you are. All right. So good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar. Uh, today we will talk about a very important topic for all those companies out there that are trying to find the right marketing tools to grow their businesses. We all know that marketing is one of the most important things when you're trying to grow your business. So please be ready to make some questions. I will be supporting that process. Uh, you can write them down either in the Q&A section or in the chat space that you, uh, you can see in your screen, in your WebEx um, platform. And I will make sure that our panelists covers them all at the end of the session. Today, we're very delighted to have Noreen Cesario as our panelist and presenter. She is the founder and principal of Market Accents. She set up the firm in 2007, following several years of strategic marketing and communications. She has a lot of experience in international financial and travel services, including with Thomas Cook, American Express, and Berkeley's Merchant Services. She has previously worked with hospitality, transportation, and supply chain and professional services, also with international distributors and Markham agencies. She's also an expert in setting up internal public relations departments. About Market Accents, it is a boutique strategic marketing and communications consultancy company. It is working with businesses to help them develop and implement memorable brands, smart marketing, striking content, relevant public relations, brand creation, brand creation and effective integrated communications. Today, this webinar will provide a strategic marketing and communications framework on which to build a feasible growth plan for SMEs and women-owned businesses so that you can establish a unique marketing space, including brand, vision, and mission, and how to interpret and develop them within a tailored marketing and communications plan. Hopefully, the webinar will leave us with a cheat list of hints and tools to use for the benefit of our companies. So I would like to welcome Noreen, and thank you for your generosity and well willingness to share some of your expertise with fellow women business owners. And I would like to kick uh, off this conversation uh, asking you as an expert, how often should we revise a marketing strategy in our companies? Thank you, Noreen. Thank you, Andrea, for that introduction. Um, and thank you all for taking time out of your busy day to join me on this webinar. Um, Andrea, I think I will answer your question towards the end of the presentation, because you will then see why it makes more sense and how it fits into the framework. So please park that question and ask me again towards the end. So to give you a bit more of a background, I, I am not sure where uh, you're all coming from, I'm assuming some of you are based in the UK, maybe some of you are based um, in other countries. I am based in London, although I am originally from Malta. For those of you who do not know a lot about this little sunken island in the Mediterranean, it lies 60 nautical miles south of Sicily. It is a marvelous place if you love history, culture, sun and sea. In fact, the sun shines for at least 300 days out of a year. To put that into perspective, that is twice the amount of sunshine enjoyed by cities in the northern half of Europe, especially us here in London, even today. But back to business. I have always been involved in marketing. Being a character that relishes a challenge, I studied and worked at the same time. I first studied communications and journalism, and then specialized and read for a master's in strategy. Prior to setting up market accents, as Andrea said, I did work in finance as well as a lot of other industries. Finance was interesting because I was involved in Forex, international payments, and cards. These are all very intangible services. In those days, we used to say that if you could make Forex and international payment, areas by which the very nature was traditionally considered very archaic and monotonous, if you could make them attractive enough to sell to the average man and woman in the street, then you were a true master indeed and understood how to market and communicate to your audience. 
So it has given me a good basis to actually frame this conversation today. Financial services, which are highly intangible services, have to be packaged and promoted across many different markets and across all industries. Before I actually was involved in consumer facing, uh, before I was involved in financial services, I was involved in consumer facing products as well, including white goods and luxury items, travel, tourism, and hospitality. And what I found in everything, in all instances, was that unless you truly had a marketing strategy which made sense, which was aligned to business goals, we were going to be completely lost. We have tried to do marketing, picking up from what we thought some people wanted to do who are higher up the food chain, but eventually it did come to we need a robust marketing strategy. Since you are listening to me today, I am assuming that you too have an interest in understanding how your business can benefit from strategic marketing. So the question that I pose today, and hopefully we will all have a clear idea at the end of it, is why strategic marketing? Is marketing itself not enough? As we say in Market Accent, we believe in, in smart marketing, marketing that is targeted and relevant. You should not be investing in initiatives that are not aligned to your goals. A marketing strategy will give you that direction, especially for your team who have to implement your plan. Your marketing strategy will direct your activities and provide direction for all your team. It will help you to market your offer and communicate consistently across all channels. And it will set the scene for your marketing plan which is the actual roadmap to help you achieve your business goals. In short, it is creating the sales opportunity. During the course of the next 45 minutes, I will be taking you on a short but intense journey, sharing a typical marketing strategy framework that you can apply to your own business, regardless of the size of your operation. I will also give you tools and tips that you can take back with your team to your team to actually start implementing some of this. A marketing strategy typically takes its lead from business objectives, priorities, and the brand promise. These shape the approach and key actions, which are then built into the strategy map and the marketing plan. A typical framework has four key areas. You can see them on screen in nice big bold colors. It's the know, it's the target, it's the decide, it's the action. Together, the whole process guides you, helping you to understand your options, define an approach, and actually move from strategy to tactics. I am going to talk you through these key areas and explain how you move from one to the other. There are various tools you can use. There are various tools people use that you may hear about and probably have never tried. Some of them you may need to learn how to use. Some of them you may prefer to allow a practitioner to process them because they are intense or time um, resourceful. My goal is not to show you how to use these tools now. If any of you are interested, please feel free to contact me separately. What I want to do is share how you can interpret what is happening and direct your team through the framework. So starting with the now, the now is the understanding. It's the understanding the market opportunity. It's looking at what is happening around you, understanding the dynamics, and I will talk a bit more about those, looking at where your offer stands next to the other offers on the market, understanding why customers should be coming to buy your services or products. So what are the customer problems? What are the needs for which your offer is actually providing a solution? As well as understanding the capabilities which limit and shape your plan of action. Your capabilities are your resources, they're your budget, they're your people, they're the skill sets that you have available. These will limit the extent that you can actually market your full plan because if you do not have enough resources internally, you may need to actually outsource to be able to achieve your goals. You will also, as we said, look at the, comp the competition, and I suggest actually even starting to get files on them and build up fact files so you understand what they are, what they are actually um, doing in terms of competing with you and your offer. And we're also looking at products and services which could potentially act as substitutes for your own offer. These could be um, 
products and services which are beginning to creep into your space. They may not necessarily be um, identical to your offer, but especially these days when we consider that everything we do is in an integrated space, when there are products and services which start to sound similar, your customers may think, ah, maybe I could try um, patching up that solution rather than going down for this. So these are all important to know and understand because they will impact what you do in this space. And obviously, you should consider the collaborators and complementers. And these are companies you may wish to partner with to go into new spaces or companies that already have um, a, an offer which could complement your own and therefore it's packaged together. You can actually attract a much larger audience. So there are numerous tools we can use. Um, and many of them, as I said, you probably would have heard of. I mean, starting off, and this is always your starting point from desktop research, field and existing research where you set out to understand where you are, what is the external market, what are the forces and factors that are actually working on your company. A tool which is very useful is called Forces by Forces, and this actually looks at the power dynamics in the industry. It looks to see whether you are in a buyer's market or a supplier's market, and where the power lies in terms of pushing. For an example, if you consider technology where it's very much a supplier's market, they are dictating how often we should almost be upgrading our equipment because they won't supply us with support for older versions. So it is very much a supplier's market rather than a buyer's market. There are tools to look at your internal position, and this is a SWOT analysis. Once again, I'm sure that most of you have heard of SWOT and probably even used them. SWOT stands for Strength, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats. Um, strength and weaknesses are the internal perspective, Threats and opportunities are the external perspective. Within strengths, you should be able to articulate what your strengths are. So whether it's strengths coming from your brand, maybe you have enough brand equity built into your company, and that is a very strong point for you to be able to then um, maximize in terms of options for strategies. Looking at your skill set, at your um, staff, looking at accreditations and awards that you have, looking at your positioning within the actual market, the reputation and image, because this all adds to the strength, even though necessarily you may not think you are that strong, but it all comes up under your title of strength. On the other hand, weaknesses are internal weaknesses that can be broken down into maybe a lack of visibility within the market space. Maybe you have not been carrying out enough marketing or networking, so companies do not know a lot about you. You may have a good product, you may have a fantastic group of sales team, but if you aren't out there and making yourself known, then your market cannot actually know about you. So these are all weaknesses, which you should be honest with yourself and mark down, because they will help you to understand how to actually then push on to finding your defining your marketing plan. There are other tools which we actually um, use to complement the SWOT analysis, and this is a pestle. Um, I apologize for using anagrams, and this is the P is for political, E is for economic, S is for fast societal, L is legal, and N is environmental. And these are the factors which impact your proposition and your offer. Why do we have to consider them? If there is legislation coming down which will impact your pricing, maybe you need to, I mean, one just which probably everybody's being impacted, at least here in the UK, is the data regulations coming through next year where all the companies have had to get their offer up to scratch and to make sure that data protection is in line. There is legislation happening in almost all jurisdictions. Much of it is different. Just make sure you are on top of it. Same thing when it comes down to understanding the culture that you're working in. If the audience is beginning to um, become more savvy, maybe more internet savvy, or more um, understanding of certain ways around your product, you may lose them as customers. So it is actually quite important to keep tabs on what's happening. And don't forget, this is what you're doing. You're taking stock of where you are in this particular point in time, because this is going to impact your steps going forward. There are other tools and methodologies, such as um, the market attractiveness and competitive intensity matrix, or the BCG matrix. Many of you may be familiar with this, the Boston Group 
Boston Consulting Group Matrix. And what this does is it helps to classify your portfolio, be it companies or products or parts of services, into four neat and distinct groups. The stars, cash cows, problem, child, and dog. I'm sure you, you probably have come across them at some point or another. These all help, once again, for you to understand where you stand on what to do with your product. Because if you decide that your product is going to be a, is a cash cow and you want to harvest it and be able to just build on what you have rather than go out and start innovating into new spaces or new markets, that is fine. That is the approach and the strategy that you are taking. So all this is just helping us to amass the current situation, the snapshot and giving us knowledge. And never never forget this. Knowledge is power when it comes to actually putting the strategy together. <clears throat> I will move next into targets. Um, you need to identify your target market. If you have a brand positioning, which would have been part of your brand platform, you would have to find your target segment. If this is missing, then we need a clear picture of our target user. How do we do this? We look at market segmentation and selection. We study the industries that are actually showing growth or high spend of money and therefore may be interested in our services or products. We look at verticals which are aligned to our particular offers. And we identify customer segments through demographics, location, behaviors, pain points, and needs. We also carry out surveys so that we gather more information. This is all part of market segmentation. And by segmenting our customer base, as well as the potential customers we want to go to, we will get a clear picture then of their usage behaviors and how to actually speak to them and where. I will also suggest carrying out regular voice of customer surveys. Maybe this is something new. And this is actually getting even closer with a smaller group of customers to actually give you ongoing vision of how they use the product or service, what they expect, and if there's anything that they want to give you back as feedback, because this can all go back into your own R&D, so to say, part, where you're looking at tweaking your offer to be able to offer it to a wider audience. We also suggest building customer profiles, and this is something you should be doing together with your sales team, because they can give you a lot of insight into the customer profile. You should have a profile for each different type of customer, identifying the segment by size, by industry, by spend, by specific pain points. When I say pain points, why, why do they need your product or service? That is a pain point. And are there any other defining elements that can help us to target our efforts? Having a must all this insight, the knowledge, including the deeper understanding of the dynamics operating in our space, we're then going to look at what sort of approach we should be going for. There are um, several approaches we could focus on depending on where we stand, and this is why it's so important having done your know and your targets before. You could decide that you want to, you are in a position where you can go on a product or service of leadership, or you are going to be differentiated through new solutions. The successful marketing will depend on the competitiveness of all the economic sectors, as well as the attractiveness of the overall market. And I will say this with a caution, while competitiveness is a function of several factors, you may wish to avoid a cost advantage strategy because this is going to be based on mass production or standardization and consumerism. And you need to assume that you have an unlimited production capacity as well as unlimited resources. And that situation may not be tenable for a business with a finite source of resources. You are trying to be sustainable. So you must make sure that whichever route you take, it actually can see you through at least a short to medium a medium term period. Longer term, you may decide if it's going to be a different strategy. Do not also forget that your strategies are not something that you've done once and will be, will be with you forever. Situation changes, you will need to revisit your strategy. And in fact, the question which Andrea posed at the beginning starts to actually make sense when you consider what is happening and what changes you are expected to happen. Because you may decide that at the moment, 
you need to focus on a cost focus. Within a year space, to a year space, maybe you're going to be branching out into a differentiation focus. There are other approaches you should also be looking at. Um, and this is when you start drilling down deeper into the elements that make up the, proposi the proposition. There are all strategic options depending on the desired level of risk and investment that you are willing to put in. At the top, uh, you are seeing in front of you a, di a diagram which actually has six options um, ranking across a high risk and investment on a low risk and investment scale. Starting at top, if you want to innovate, if you are interested in disrupting the market, then you have a, um, uh, an appetite for high risk and investment. You probably have funding behind you and you can go down that route. If you want to grow and you want to expand into new markets, you may be looking at um, partnerships or collaboration. You may be looking at new segments, not necessarily even new market space, but you will be needing to invest to go down that route. Be it that investment is going to come through in the form of marketing spend, advertising spend, sales stuff which need to be um, employed and skilled up. So they make up all these factors which will give you that high risk and investment um, approach. On the other hand, you may decide at the moment that your space is being invaded by companies which are nibbling at the market share. This happens a lot. There's a lot of border creep which has begun to come through because of the fact that we are now all global and mobile. We're using integrated channels, we're on the channel. So before where um, an audience group, a segment group may not have had access or thought about the solution, now they can see that there's different ways to look at it. Similarly, companies which are offering products may start looking at uh, adjacent or complementary markets because they think they can tweak their offer to actually move there. So the border creep is there. You may therefore decide that you need to consolidate your base, make sure you are rewarding loyalty within your customer base and retain that. You also may wish to go down harvesting it, use that base to do cross-sell and upsell and get more out of your customer base. This would be your cash cow. You know you have a good solid base and you can therefore build on it. Or you may decide hold on a second here, I need to pause for the next year because I am going to be building up my resources internally, therefore I want to carry on with this particular approach for a six months year to a year, then potentially maybe start looking at innovating or even consider going through the exit route. So as you can see, that one approach is not the right approach for everyone and it will depend a lot on what you plan to do with the company, which comes back to your goals and your objectives. However, it is important that you decide because it, it is from this approach that the marketing team can then decide on the mix it will use to actually market your offer. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with our marketing mix. The marketing mix has been in use for the since the 60s when we had we started off with the four P's, which were product, place, price and promotion. And then in the 80s when we realized we're tending to go more down the services route, another three P's were added and those are um, the people, the physical evidence and the processes. And that brings us up nicely into our seven P's. Each of these areas includes a lot of strategies which will um, can be tweaked to make sure you achieve your objectives. I am going to talk you through briefly each and every one of them, but I will not go into the strategies in full detail because that is something that probably can take another webinar all on its own. Product. When we talk product, the product should fit the task the consumer or customer is expecting it to be. It should work and it should be what they are expecting to pay for. Place is where the offer should be available from for your customer or your consumer to consume. So if they are buying it from a shop, a high street, or if they're getting it through a mail order, or if there's a call center that's calling out and that transaction is taking place on the line, or if there's an account executive team which is going out and selling, or e-commerce, or an online shop, all these make up a place. And it is important that you understand how you are actually controlling the elements within the mix. Price. Price should always be seen as representing good value for money. This does not necessarily mean that it should be the cheapest available. There are various pricing strategies to consider. Remember 
that if there is budget, the customers are usually happy to pay for a value add option that works really well for them. Strategies that you could be looking at could be penetration pricing strategies, loss leader strategies, loyalty strategies, cost plus strategies. As I said, this could take a whole webinar on its own. Suffice to say, think about it and think what you want your customer base to do. We'll talk a bit more about that actually in some of the next slides. When we're looking at promotion, this is what probably most of the man industry companies associate with marketing. This is what they see. This includes the advertising, PR, the sales, promotion, the personal selling, all the social media that's being done. In this day and age, we're omnichannel, we're integrated, so there is a lot of promotion coming through. All these tools should communicate your brand message consistently to the right audiences. And that they should be receiving it in the manner that they would like to receive it in and hear it, whether it is giving them information or appealing to their emotions. There is a lot of effort that, can, that is actually getting lost from here unless it is actually targeted. This is where those customer profiles I mentioned in the targeting come into their own as you delve deeper into customer insights. If you know that your particular segment is um, not very internet savvy. They actually prefer to still receive um, flyers at home. They prefer uh, briefings. They prefer visits. Then it is no use putting all your offer out on the internet because they are not going to see it. Now, we do need to remember we are in an integrated environment, so we carefully need to examine each and every channel that we're using. There is a tool here called Part of Engagement. Once again, I cannot take you through it because it would uh, we do not have enough time. But that actually explains the use of the channel together with uh, what you want to achieve um, from your message. I'm coming next now into people. People are our biggest asset. We are all reliant on our staff and team, internal and external. Many of us may have outsourced parts of our, um, uh, our work internally. You may have even outsourced sales. All of them are your stakeholders. They are all ambassadors for the business, and therefore it is important to make sure that they all understand the strategy, they all understand the product offer and the benefits, because they are doing the sales as well. Processes. When we are delivering a service, part of that delivery is probably done with the customer presence. So how you deliver the service is very much part of what the customer is paying for. It's part of the packaging. So do not ignore the process. Because if, you have, if you're failing there, then the customer is not walking away happily. And then the physical evidence or environment. Almost all services include some physical elements, even if the bulk of what the customer is paying for is intangible. Do you remember my comments on financial services at the start of this webinar? Financial services, highly intangible. People can't see them. They can't visualize them. So we presented our customers with brochures, flyers, welcome packs, cards, so that it's materialized this in their mind. Even if the material is not physically printed, and we say we use a lot of PDFs, most of our work can come through an e-form, that is still helping to actually um, materialize it in the customer and make them feel that they are receiving a physical product. Um, our next section is actually action. This is where we're calling it the call to action. I have actually put on screen for you a customer journey, and it is important to understand what happens within a customer journey, because the customer touch point is where the customer will react to our call to action. So when a customer starts realizing they have a, a need or that there's a that they have a problem, that is their awareness stage. At that age, at that stage, they do not have the solution in mind, but they know they have a challenge. So they would be they would be sitting there in front of their computers, beginning to actually search for potential solutions. In the first two stages, which is the awareness and the interest, they are gathering that knowledge. They are getting up to date with what they could be doing. They're probably formulating budgets in their mind, and they're planning. They're speaking to colleagues. They're looking at case studies, they're looking at white papers, just gathering knowledge to be able to say, 
Okay, so if I need this particular service, who can I be approaching? And they start maybe whipping down a list of companies to approach. And then they would move into the engagement phase, which is where it's in the green phase, right in the middle of the screen. Um, and this is here where they probably may come and consider you if you have come to their notice. And that is why it is so important to make sure that our messages are consistently where our potential customers could be seeing them. They will engage with us and they will ask us questions and they will consult with us. At that stage, we're not yet in the game. We're still in a consultation phase. It could go either way. We could lose them. So once again, it is so important that we still maintain that relationship and keep it going. If they feel they have enough information, they may ask us to quote. It could be a formal quote, an RFQ. It could be um, a request for a proposal, just asking us on the phone, what do you think? Could you quote me for this job and that job? Whatever it is, they are asking us to give them more information, potentially with the price, because they need to evaluate it. They want to evaluate the ability for us to deliver that service or product. They want to evaluate if it is value for money, and they want to evaluate if the price is right. Having gone through that, if they feel that they are happy to come on board, then that is that moment of purchase. That is the confirmation. We now have them. They are now our customers. But that's not the end of the game. We want them to be repeat customers. We want to extend that relationship. We need to make sure that the process goes through and we haven't fallen flat when we actually come to doing the production and delivery. As I said before, processes are part of the delivery. So if while the service is being delivered, whether it is a software you have, send them the link or um, they receive on a CD and they have to upload, or whether it is a physical product they are receiving, the process is still part of it. If we lose them at that stage, they will not come back for um, another purchase, for a repurchase. So it is important that all along that customer journey, we really truly understand the touch points we have with the customer. Hopefully, having established that we're working happily together, you then continue to keep the brand alive. And you need to do this um, with relationship is and proper quality execution. And it is a complete cycle. It goes on. This does not end. So this is where we are creating that course of action through the awareness, the interest, the purchase, and obviously pushing on the loyalty and the retention. I now am going to show you um, an example of um, a team execution. So having decided that we need to carry out and do brand awareness on the market space, we're going to be looking at the channels and actually working through them to decide the mix. So in this case, wanting to do brand awareness, and it is important that we actually clarify what we're doing because the tools can be used, um, the, the channels can be used for different um, results, and how much you invest in them depends on what you want to achieve. So in this case, let us say that you we are taking the website. And the website is our calling card online. And therefore, it is very much a tool, um, an important tool in brand awareness. Obviously, its reach is very high. It is out there in the open. Anybody who wishes to actually um, visit the site or be given the link is going to go on. You don't know where it's reaching or how. It's global. The lead time and the effort to actually build the site, maintain it, and keep it current is quite high. You need to have resources. You need to have content. You may be buying those services in. So it, it, it's quite an effort, even on its own, in keeping that website going. Your message size is probably large because you've put all your proposition there. And because you don't know who is going to be coming to the site, you need to make sure that there is enough messages on the site for them to actually stop different pages. Maybe you're pointing them onto different landing pages. You're obviously not managing targeting 100% because you cannot. You, don't, you cannot control who is coming to your site. So your targeting here would be considered as medium to low. And obviously, you definitely are not personalizing because you cannot personalize on a website. The cost is probably high. And your control is probably not that high. It's medium because, as we said, you cannot control who's coming to the site. Have you built credibility with your market space? Probably medium. They know they're coming to a site that is written by the people who own the business, and therefore they're obviously going to write something that's going to make me buy. If you then you consider 
um, another uh, tool further down the road. And that's considered something that probably a lot of you are doing, which is um, um, social media. In the case of social media, your reach is medium because not everybody's using all the same social media at the same time. You may have followers on Twitter. You may have people that you are actually interacting with a bit more um, intensity on Facebook that you've built a good relationship with. You have a group of followers on LinkedIn and you have your company page on LinkedIn. You also have your Google Plus and you've got your Instagram and, and the whole list goes on. It is the reach is only as big as the people who are tuning in at the precise time to actually see your social media. As we know, if we take tools like Twitter, that is almost like um, a sounding board for you just putting messages out there. People may come, they may see them, they may not see them. On Facebook, maybe there's a bit of a deeper chance for them to get closer because they can write more comments and uh, you see it a bit more often. What I'm trying to say is the reach here is maybe not as high as you would like it to be. The time and the effort, unfortunately, is medium and probably I would say even medium to high because you have to maintain the social media. Having established it as a channel and as an account, you do need to continue pushing on it. Your message size <laughs> is very restricted. As you know, we we'll have to count our characters. I know Twitter is beginning to extend a bit, but still, putting your message in such few words and spaces, that's tough. So it's basically a small message that you're sending out. Targeting medium to low because it is just reaching out. And if you're sending direct messages or replying, you're not being very personalized or targeted. So those two are very low. Um, the cost is in our favor. In this case, it's medium to low. A lot of us do it ourselves. We all use tools like Hootsuite on our mobiles while we're out and about, and we interact and we continue pushing it. Um, so our control on that is also medium, potentially a bit low at times. We may not be totally on top of it. And even if we have a social media team, they're not there all the time in the evening and over the weekend maintaining it. So your your effectiveness is um, is medium. In terms of credibility and building up the credible base that you want to have, this is the medium because people know they are actually interacting with somebody from the company. So it is important that we actually are human and that we give a good image and representation back on the market. Um, I could carry on going through all of these. What I'm trying to um, give you here is show you the importance of understanding the channel and the theme that you actually wish to, um, to follow in your campaign. Obviously, I cannot stop without, I cannot carry on without telling you to build into your plan, monitoring and measurement. This is most important. You do not know if you have actually succeeded in achieving your objective unless you measure it and monitor it. On the screen, you actually have a sample um, plan of monitoring the measurements. You can see we're looking at the activity, we're looking at qualitative measurements and quantitative measurements. Quantitative, we're doing statistics, we're doing surveys, we're analyzing numbers. We had an increase of 5% this month. We've had a decrease of 2% on the social media. We're quantifying this, so we actually can see numbers. Qualitative is more getting um, a, a viewpoint, so it's subjective, but it's going out and speaking, getting that customer voice of customer survey done. It's uh, looking at your engagement and analyzing the tone on the engagement. It's getting warmer. Are you creating more of an interaction? Um, and on the website, are we, are we getting higher sign-ups or are we seeing them decrease? What's the engagement that we're having with potential investors who are looking at our effects? So when you are actually considering it as a whole, it is most important that you build it into every part of activity that you do. I hope you actually also have KPIs, because these would naturally just be straight into your KPIs. Um, I'm very conscious of the time, and I'm going to share with you now a few sample worksheets which you can take back to your business. If there's anything that you want to ask, please feel free to ask. And as I said, I'm also quite happy to take a few questions after, the, um, after we've had our webinar, and you can email directly. So I'm going to show you um, one of the worksheets, which I find is very useful to have, because it explains what you're doing. And this is a very easy visual tool to have for your internal stuff. So to be in the game, these are key success elements which you require 
participate in the marketplace. These help you to be there. If you haven't actually cracked these or if you're not on top of them, then you're not doing a very good job of actually even being in the industry on the marketplace. So this is a story of two hearts. Going through the, to the box on the left-hand side, we have our customers and we will actually segment them so that we know who we're targeting. We will target cleverly so that we actually can speak to the right customer and not do guerrilla marketing and just shower it out with everyone. Location, we, we identify the location. If we're serving a global base, then you need to be aware that they expect a 24 by 7 solution because it's global, because somebody in the southern hemisphere is going to be wanting to speak to you when you're probably asleep if you're based in the northern hemisphere. So it is very important that you actually define your location. Your product and services, these are, it goes without saying, it's your proposition, it's your offer. Know it and understand it and understand its limitations. Competitors, and it is important here that we define competitors in the widest way possible. You have the competitors who are actually close to you and that you know, but you are participating in a much wider arena. And you could have competitors coming through from adjacent verticals who all of a sudden see that their offer is complementary. We talked a bit about this earlier on. So it is important to always bear that in mind. Channel acquisition and support, how you acquire your customers, how you service your customers is important. What channels are you using? Are you um, an online acquisition and support, in which case you may be needing to ensure you have chatbots 24 by 7, uh, you have good documentation, because it's almost going to be a DIY for your customers. If you are providing a call center, if you have an account team that's actually taking calls in, you may have technical teams that are on site, on location, all these are all part of the proposition and how that service delivery is being packaged. If we take the other side, this is where we actually consider elements which will give us a competitive advantage. And it is important that we actually treat them pro properly. So when we're looking at this, I mentioned earlier on the pricing strategies. You can see how important it is. The way you price your offer is a very strong, important consideration. If your operation is cost advantage, then maybe you are in a position to start um, giving uh, pricing strategies which will actually help you to harvest your base. If you are disadvantaged, disadvantaged within your operation space, maybe you're needing to look at your internal processes, maybe you need to be investing more on CRM, your sales teams can't cope with all the data which is coming in or out, you have a lot of legacy issues. When I say legacy issues, I'm talking about maybe you have um, computer systems and programs that haven't been updated and that may be falling foul even with data protection. So all this can help you price better and that's why it is there as part of the cost advantage element. We also look at our proposition and the proposition, you have a USP, you are within your unique space, so you should be shouting that out. You should be promoting it to the highest level, which is why underneath the proposition you have marketing and promotion. And they actually come hand in hand in terms of the way you are using that to your competitive advantage. And as I've mentioned briefly, the operations. Operations will have quite an impact on the way you deliver your service. Most of us these days are in service, um, uh, service companies. So operations, processes, the tools you're using, your computer system, your, as I mentioned, CRM, or maybe your um, e-commerce and how that's fitting in and you're getting the data back in. If these aren't actually streamlined and allowing you to process properly, then you are falling within achieving and succeeding in that space. So having done your strategy, it's a very good summary for you to present to your team. And you may wish to take this back and work it through to start actually seeing where you have gaps in what you're doing. Another tool I want to leave you with and this is actually very self-explanatory. It's actually summarizing those goals which you have, which you've decided on, which came out of your um, analysis further on. I've given you here three um, examples of what um, your goals could be. And you could say, well, my first goal is adding and retaining high-value users. So how am I going to do that? I need to 
upgrade my customer base, get them to upsell more, get them to get my sales team to upsell more to my base so that I can actually turn them into high value users and then make sure I retain them. So I need to look at loyalty programs. And as you can see, that is where it comes through on the second part of the box. How will you achieve it? So in this case, I am going to focus on building a loyalty program for my top tier customers. And at the bottom of my customer base, I've got those dormant accounts, which maybe touched me two years ago, but they haven't spoken to me since. So I want to start trying to reactivate them because I can maybe start getting them back to be high value users. If not, they will give me insights into why my proposition is failing with them. And therefore, I could actually do a turnaround there. So these are just, I'm very conscious of the time. So I'm going to go to the other slide, but this is actually self-explanatory in terms of the way you use it. This is where you start um, defining what you want to do so that it's clear with your team. Um, so you're mapping your strategic actions within the customer base. So you're setting targets out within your sales team for customer satisfaction. And you're saying, look, sales phone calls, they need to be answered within at least an hour, we have to get back to them with an answer, with a quotation, within two days. You're setting benchmarks. You're setting targets so that your customer knows what to expect and is happy. You may be needing um, to start surveying your customer base. Regular touch points with your customers make them feel appreciated. So don't be afraid to go back to them. And also, you come back to being front of mind. Or you could be saying you're actively pushing to get your top tier clients to upgrade to more of your proposition or deliver more value-added services. So what you have here are clear actions that your team knows they can go back and actually um, implement in their team. And I am going to show you one other worksheet, which is actually very valuable. And you should take this back and work it through with your sales team, because they are the people who truly can give you the insight. Marketing can do the research. They can pull it together. They can prepare all the, um, all the material. The salespeople are the ones on the front line, and they actually hear the responses. So if you actually look at the diagram you have, then we are asking very basic questions. So I'm going on the top line. Our customers are asking, what's my problem? I want to define my problem so I can understand what it is. So this is where, when we were looking at the customer journey, there were even those first two boxes, understanding their issues and gathering information. So what do we need to give them to be able to help them at that stage? We should be showing them industry trends so they know if they have a problem. We should be showing them benchmarks of where maybe they need to up their game and start buying our services because that is going to get them to be a high, um, high delivery company. We show them case studies. We give them how-to guides and write white papers and brochures. All these will start helping them to gather this information. How often should we be doing that? Well, if we are available 24-7 globally, then you have to be online all the time. They have to be there. They have to access them from your site. Maybe you want to target your potentials and you want to do this with a quarter action that's sent out once a quarter. So it's nice questions, easy questions. How do I fix it? Are you right for me? These are the questions the customer would ask. These are the questions you should be asking your team to supply you with the answers. Um, I'm conscious of the time. And at this stage, I want to say that when I was putting this webinar together, my aim was to provide you with a strategic framework, marketing and communications, on which you can build a sustainable growth plan. Hopefully, I have given you enough information through the framework and the tools and the methodologies that you can take this back to your business and start putting some of it into practice. As you can see, there is loads to cover. This is a massive area, and we will be definitely more than our allocated time today. However, if you want to ask any questions, um, I am going to say this for the people on the webinar, I will be offering a half hour chat consultancy and we will send you details in the email. So please do not be, uh, do, do not worry about picking this up with me because I'd be most happy to have a quick chat with you. Um, I am now opening the floor for any questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Noreen. Uh, it was very, it, it was a very interesting webinar. I hope everybody enjoyed it as, enjoyed it as much as I did. 
Um, so please, everyone, um, now is the moment wherein you can make the questions. Um, we have one question. It says that, well, they want to know if the worksheets are going to be available. I understand you will be able to share this presentation and these um, webinar is going to be, the recording is going to be available in our WeConnect Academy channel as well. So you will, you can go back to it and find this information. However, I would suggest that if you would like to cover or go a little bit um, more in detail about these worksheets, um, feel free to contact Noreen and you can have a 30-minute complimentary uh, consultancy call so that you can answer all the questions you may have in regards to the worksheets. Um, we also have another comment. Actually, I'm very conscious, Andrea. I did not answer your question. Sorry. <laughs> um, yes. When, yes. when, go ahead. So, your question to me was, how often should you be reviewing your plan? This is a question which will change. However, you should review your plan at least once a year to ensure that all your objectives, your target demographics, your research, all the activities still fit and make sense. If, you're, if your business is in an industry that changes more frequently, then you should be revising it more frequently and set review intervals such as once a quarter or once every six months. So this is not you've done the strategy once, you put it in a cupboard and you forget all about it. This has to be a living document that you can share with all your team, review, adjust, and move on. All right. Thank you. Excellent. So I'm getting a lot of very good comments. Um, some of our participants are saying that it was an excellent webinar, it had excellent content, and they want to come back to you at a later stage. So yes, um, we suggest you to uh, reach out to Noreen, um, to Noreen, sorry, to Noreen, um, to her email. You can see it in the in the um, in the presentation. Um, we encourage you to send her an email with more questions uh, so you can connect directly. I don't know if there's any other question. I'm, there's another one here. You were talking about building customer profiles. What kind yes. of information do you think, um, what kind of basic information do you think a company should uh, look for or research about a, a, a potential customer? What would be, I don't know, the top five things that you would suggest looking for to build a profile of a customer? Um, well, a customer profile, as I said, does depend on demographics. So let's take a bit of an example because it will make more sense. Let us assume you are targeting, um, you, you are in the professional company space and you sell legal services and you sell legal services to cover families, family wealth, maybe um, divorce, that sort of environment. So immediately you start thinking, okay, who is my customer base? Uh, I'm talking... Um, consumers here, I'm going to individuals. So I need to be able to speak to families, young families potentially, who may be having some problems. Um, so what I'm trying to say is we need to understand the, the actual, almost you need to imagine them as people. So if you had to paint a picture of your typical customer, what would it be like? Which industry would he or she come from? How old would they be? What would they be, um, where would they be buying my services from? Why would they be buying our services? And how would they use it? And that's when you can start building your profile so that you can actually base them around the customer rather than just the radical data of, okay, it's a SME, it's 50 million turnover, they're based in this country and they want this. You need to get deeper and deeper because that is what will give you the insight. And this is where you start actually also grouping them together because depending on identifying marks, they could all be companies that are part of a network, for example. They could all be We Connect members. So I know, fine, the women-owned businesses, they are based um, in a specific geographic location. They have a particular need that they are trying to get into tender situations. So these are all the insights that you can build up upon them. There actually are um, templates that you, you can build to use back with your company, and maybe I can put one together to share and share with the people who are actually on the webinar. All right. Thank you so much. 
Yes, we will be sharing all the information um, about this webinar, the presentation, and also the link to the video, as I said previously, um, with you directly through your email. And then you can contact Noreen if you have more questions. So you, we encourage you to contact Noreen. Um, I don't think there's any other question. Um, please, if you have any other question, this is the moment to type it in. Um, if we don't have any other questions, I think, well, one of the comments here says that it is a lot of information. It is very dense and needs to be digested first. So uh, you're probably going to get a lot of emails later uh, with more questions. So that is perfect. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so thank you so much, Noreen. It was it was very um, interesting and I get, I think very important for most of um, our members, our weebies that are in this process of growing their businesses and marketing. It's we understand it's 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 difficult to understand sometimes, but it's very important. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your energy. It was great. And thank you for all the attendees. Um, please stay tuned for more information about uh, coming um, upcoming webinars next year. We encourage you, if you have any topic you would like to share, just as this one, we encourage you to sh uh, send an email or uh, fill up an application, and you can also do a webinar. You're getting here a lot of um, nice comments. Thank you so much, Noreen. You're a star. Yes, oh, you thank are. Thank you all. That's brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone, and uh, stay tuned. Have a great thank day. You.